Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mildred, and I am an alcoholic from Toronto. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your kind your kind introduction, Jerry. Um, yeah, I've been around a while. My dry date is May the 18th, 1973. Uh, I have a home group. I am active in that home group. And I have always had a home group. I've always had a sponsor. My sponsor, the, I had the same sponsor for 44 years. And to that man, I owe so much of who I am today and how my life moved forward. And uh, I have a sponsor now. Sponsorship changes, you know, in, in, like now I need different things, but I believe in that process absolutely. Because as I grow spiritually, I need to have somebody. I never get beyond that where I don't need somebody to say, hey, watch it. And um, so with that, uh, what time do you want me to finish, Jerry? About five, five minutes to nine would be great. Okay. All right. Well, you know, when you've been around a long time, there are many, many stories that you, that you can't tell. So um, I love the big book. You know, the longer I'm sober, the more I read the book. And it's always amazing to me that they must at some point put stuff in that wasn't there yesterday. Because you read, isn't it true? You read it and you say, I never heard that before. It happens all the time. Somebody will say, well, you know, I read this. That they'll, they'll quote something from the book. And I think, I never read that before. And then I go check it and there it is. So this is a a wonderful alive program. You know, if you're new or relatively new and you say, oh man, she's been around 48 years. What has she got to say? It's an alive program and therefore life keeps changing. And that's the way it should be. We should keep growing. People sometimes say to me, why do you still go to meetings? I'm alive. That's why I'm alive. And If I'm alive, I've got to keep responding to life. It's not okay to say, well, I did that 20 years ago. So, you know, that's the way sobriety is. It keeps on being exciting. I love the the statement in the big book where it says, even so has God restored us to our right minds. And if you want to know the page, it's page 57. You know, sometimes I hear people say, you know, I don't care where the page is. Sometimes I do because there are certain pages that have things on them that I want I want to relate to, that I want to incorporate into my life. So um, if you're relatively new, just remember, at 48 years, you have to do the same things you did when you were new, one day at a time. If life changes, you have different experiences and so on. So where did I start? I started on the prairies in Canada, in Saskatchewan. My mom and dad had come from the States, and um, they had a big farm there. My dad was very successful. We were Roman Catholic, and there were 10 kids in the family. And I was the baby of that family. Each of those things is very important in my life. How did I start out in life? I think it's always very important. Not, it didn't make me an alcoholic. That's not what I'm saying, but it formed the way I thought. It formed the way what I expected from life. It put some beliefs into me that I lived from. And I have to tell you, it was those beliefs and that thinking that took me to the gates of insanity and death because I was not okay. The way I saw the world, I didn't like the world by the time I, and that's not because I have a horror story. I don't. I was loved. I was the baby 
they weren't expecting me. And so I, the nine brothers and sisters, and they fussed over me, but something happened. I realized that somebody in that family that I loved was crying. That was my sister, Dora. Dora was, as they said in those days, retarded. What she was was a slow learner. And the school system didn't know what to do in those days with those. They kept her in grade three till she was 16. And she cried a lot. And I cried with her because I felt the world sucked. Like I wanted her to be able to have a life the way my other brothers and sisters were. I was three. She was 16 or 17 at that time. And I cried with her. I thought my brothers and sisters would fix it. They fixed everything else for me. And when I said, get help Dora to stop crying, she kept, she continued to cry. What I didn't know was, of course, you can't, you can't fix a situation like that. But nobody told me that. And so I thought, they don't care about me. They don't, nobody cares about me. They don't see me. I'm not important. And that's what I spent my life trying to prove trying to make people love me, trying to make people like me, trying to make people recognize me. And I'll tell you, I sold my soul for that. I did what I had to do, but it didn't work. So anyway, we were Roman Catholic. And so I knew about God, I thought. And I prayed to that God that I understood made sunsets and he made the stars and the moon. This is good. Now you're going to fix my sister. And that didn't happen. It did, but not on my time. And I became very hostile to God. And that, too, is part of the way my life went. So that's the start of my life. I was smart, I, but I, didn't, I never fit. Somehow or other, I was always too young, I'm too old, I'm too something. I don't fit. But I took a drink at five, and that ended the trouble completely. Dr. Silkworth said it perfectly. He said, we get a sense of ease and comfort. And man, did I get a sense of ease and comfort. The nasty world went away. I loved the world. My, I loved everything about the world when I was drinking. I, as a child, called it the stuff in the bottle. I need the stuff in the bottle. Of course, you at three, at five, you don't drink like you do when you're 35, but you drink. I learned to lie and cheat and steal. I knew at where every house that we visited, I knew where the booze was. And I always found an excuse to go there. And I would take water and I would fill the bottles. Nobody had to teach me that. And so I drank. I finished high school at 14, and of course, I couldn't get into university, so I hung around at home, and there was a, a choir in our town, a big singing choir. We went all over the place and sang, and uh, that was a happy time in my drinking because I ran around with a bunch of boys, and uh, there were a couple of girls in, the, in that bunch, too. And uh, we partied and we drank and and I really liked that part. And somebody spoiled it. One of the girls in the group announced she was going to become a nun. A nun. And uh, I knew about nuns. I'd been to a finishing school run by nuns. And uh, everybody made a fuss over her and I didn't like that. I waited three weeks, and then I announced I'm going to be a nun, and they all laughed at me. Wrong thing to do. Now I've got something to prove. You tell me I can't become a nun. Well, I tried. The sisters I went to school with, they said, no, you don't belong here. You're too wild. The sisters at home at the hospital, they said, no, you don't belong here. You're too wild. The pastor said, no, you're too wild. And the more they said I didn't belong, the more I became determined. And finally, I found this convent who took me. They were 2,500 miles away. I was in Saskatchewan. They were in Ontario and uh, packed my suitcase. I'm 17 years old, and I head out for the convent. They didn't smell me. 
you know, if if you know anything about convents, this was a monastery, and I can tell you, uh, they didn't smell me. They took they took me in, no questions asked, and I was drunk for the fifteen years I was there. It made life in the convent manageable. Was it a bad life? No. Was it a good life? No. Was it life? Yeah. What did I learn? The one thing that I got out of it was this. I started to read spiritual books because I need an answer. I That feeling that I had as, as a child just grew worse. I don't fit anywhere. I don't like where I am. I don't like people. I I don't know how to do life. And at the end of 15 years, I left the convent thinking that it's okay now. Change your clothes. Got my secular clothes back. I'm no longer Sister Mary Eugenia. I'm back. I have my secular name back, and I'm absolved from the vows. And I think I'm good to go. You bet I was good to go. Only I didn't know where I was going. I was on my way to hell. I found the bars. I found the men. And the men found me. And I lived a life of degradation. Three week, three months go by and I'm in jail. Jail! And I made such a fuss. I told the cop he couldn't keep me there. He said, watch me. And he closed locked the door. And I made such a fuss. The chief of police happened to be in the town that day, in the jail that day, on business, and he came down. And I still remember him coming into my cell and yelling at me. And he said, you disgust me. He said, in all my years as a cop and as the chief, he said, I've never seen an ex-nun in jail. And he said, you better not show back here again. And uh, what's the matter with me? I don't know. I need to drink. That's all I know. And don't tell me I can't drink and don't tell me I shouldn't drink because I don't. But I need to drink to function because I'm so screwed up. In those years, seven years that uh, after leaving the convent, I was locked up 32 times in psych wards. I was in jail several times. I had 38 electroshock treatments. In those days, they used to give you electroshock treatments, trying to calm you down. Didn't calm me down, so they just kept giving them to me. That I have a brain today is quite amazing to me. And... Uh, uh, I married my own psychiatrist. Now, there's a smart thing to do, I'll tell you, especially when you're alcoholic and he's alcoholic. And uh, but the good part of all that was the life of degradation was horrible. But the good part of it was I met Dr. Hoffer. And Dr. Hoffer, if you know, if you've ever read A Comes of Age, he was a friend of Bill Wilson's, and he had used LSD successfully with schizophrenics, and Bill thought maybe LSD would work with it. I never took it, but I met Dr. Hoffer, and he was the one who introduced me. Uh, he said, you should go to AA. And uh, I knew about AA because I have a brother who died sober 49 years. And at that time, people said he was going to die. And my dad called me one day and he said, your brother is going to die. He said, there's this wonderful organization. He said, they call it Alcoholics Anonymous. And this would have been in the early 50s. And it had come, been brought to Saskatchewan. And my brother had gotten sober. And my dad said, it's a wonderful organization. He didn't know at the time I needed, I would need it one day. But it stuck in my brain. And when Dr. Hoffer said, you should go to AA, I went. I have no brains. I don't know how to live. I go to AA, I'm going to get transformed. That's what I thought. Somebody's going to do it to me. You know, for somebody who had the education I have, for somebody who had had the training that I have, I sure didn't know much. 
I just thought, well, I'll go there and they'll fix me. And I don't believe there is, that doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. I sat in AA for five and a half years stoned. And I have to tell you, it doesn't work that way. You know, people tried to help me. I was in Prince Albert. And if you know anything about our history, you know that some of the finest AA members were situated there. People like Cease Cargo, Mac Cheater, and so on. And Chuck Chamberlain used to come. Chuck became a good friend of mine because Chuck uh, was friends with Cease and Elmer and that crowd. And he'd talk to me and he'd say, Mildred, you have only one problem. And I thought, what's that stupid man talking about? One problem? I've got money problems. I've got men problems. I've got sex problems. I've got work problems. I've got home problems. They know you have one problem. And he wouldn't budge from that. He'd say, you think you're separate. And if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, that's the message. I do not believe anymore I'm separate. I'm one with God. I'm one with everybody. And interestingly enough, science teaches that now. So I uh, was in AA five and a half years. This phony, you know, everybody else is going to the meetings and I'm sitting there saying I'm alcoholic and I'm sober. I, was, I wasn't I was drinking, but I wasn't sober. I was stoned all the time. And so one day I just left and I drank again. And I won't go into the horrors. You know, the book says, the reading you did, it takes us to the gates of insanity and death. And that's exactly where I was. At the gates of insanity and death, rapping on the door. Because... The last two months of my drinking life, I was on a park bench. I don't look like somebody who's on a park bench. I can tell you I was there two months, and I could tell you a whole lot of stories about that life. The police picked me up on the morning of May the 18th, 1973, and took me to a psych ward. And I woke up there, NDTs, and uh, I don't know what I did, but I was there. And so a couple of days went by, and the nurse on Sunday morning, so my dry date is May the 18th, but my God date is May the 20th, because the morning of the 20th, the nurse told me they were going to discharge me. That was not good news. My husband and I had separated. We were, you know, we... We said the vows, but we were never really married. That was a stupid thing to do. And uh, I wound up on the park bench, as I said. So that morning, the nurse said to me, you know, we're going to discharge you today. Well, I think that the average person would be happy to be discharged out of a psych ward, not me. I have no home. I have no place to go. I have no money. I have no job. I have no friends. Everybody has washed their hands with me. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I do not know how to live. You know that, that piece in the big book where it says, we have to concede to our innermost selves. That's a big word, a nice word, a lovely word. Concede. I give in. I didn't give in to alcoholism. I did that years ago. But I never did anything about stopping drinking. What I conceded that morning was, I do not know how to live. I tell you, I am madly in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm madly in love with Alcoholics Anonymous because I have learned to live through the steps, through the meetings, through the program, through doing service, through being here tonight through friendship, through knowing Jerry and all that kind of stuff. I've learned how to live. And but I didn't know that morning. The only the only thing I could come to was this. End it. Suicide. Done. I didn't know how to live. I didn't I was just that broken. So I asked the nurse to get my coat. 
because they were going to discharge me, but I knew what I was going to do. I knew where I was going and what I was going to do. She went to get my coat and I had a spiritual awakening. Go figure. Go figure. I still remember the place I was standing and I remember one minute I'm thinking, I'm out of here. I don't care what's on the other side. I'm out of here. I can't do this stupid life. It's never worked for me. And then compulsion was taken. You know, if I know nothing else, I know that uh, God visited me that way. There's no other answer. There was nobody in the room. Uh, nobody was on the phone. But God was in the grace, took the compulsion, took the obsession, and in 48 years, I have never had it back. It's gone. See, I think that's the grace of God that's available at all times. You know what? I, I, I really believe this, that we always get what it is we need. I think that's the goodness of God. Sometimes it doesn't look like that. I may want a new car when it isn't a new car that's going to move me along. Because I think the whole purpose of life is that spiritual awakening. It's about waking up to the fact that God is here and that there are other people on the planet and I should be involved. That's why I think service is such a great gift. Because if you can do for others and do it for the right reasons, it's so helpful. I remember standing there. I didn't know what had happened. I hadn't prayed. I don't think that's what prayer is. Prayer isn't words. Prayer is of the heart. And my heart that day was, I can't do life. I don't know how. And grace poured in. And I remember saying, I don't know how to live sober. I didn't. And I'll bet you when we get new people, that's always the problem. We don't know how to live sober. How do you put your comfort away? How do you put the relief away that you get from whatever? You know, I used to, in the days when I was still drinking, if if I had been sober while I was on my way to the liquor store, in anticipation, I'd start to shake because the, I was going to have the goodness. I see some of you nodding your heads because I, I was going to get my relief. And now... That's not the way it is. I'm going to have to do it sober. And it scared me. And uh, I said, I don't know how to do it. You'll have to send me somebody. And there was a rap in the door. And I tell you, that really happened. You know, I think sometimes we really need to listen to each other. Because when we tell these stories, they're not just stories. This isn't a made up whatever. This This really happened. There was a rap in the door and a man stood there. You know, at the time when this happened, I couldn't put it all together, but I put it together now. I think he was there by the grace of God because why was he there just at the right time? He rapped on the door and he said, I saw you at breakfast. You're in trouble, aren't you? All right. He said, you're alcoholic. I said, yeah, you want to make something of it? And he said, no. He said, I came because he said, I thought maybe I could offer you some help. Help? He said, I know of a hospital where they they treat. You know, those of you that are young and that are newer, you know that in 1973, there were no treatment centers, not in Toronto. I don't know if there were in the States. There sure weren't in Toronto. But Dr. Bell had started a hospital, and he 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 said he he understood that sometimes addicted people needed extra help, and so he had started this place. And this man said to me, "If you will go, I will take you there tomorrow." And so he did, and that was the start of a new life for me. I was there twenty eight days, and when I was done. They gave me, because I had no home, um, they gave me um, enough money to get a room on Skid Row. So I've, I've seen the highlight of life. I've seen the low, low part of life. 
I know what it is like to be hungry. I know what it is to have an empty fridge. I know what it's like to live alone. That first year, I was totally alone. You know, when I think about it, people just walked away from me. They had were fed up with the likes of me and the way I behaved and the way I treated people and so on. I got a job in a factory sweeping the floor. And uh, like I said, I think God always gives us what we need. I needed a friend and I had one. He was the chief psychiatrist at at uh, Don at Donwood, and uh, he said to me, "You're going to come and see me once a week," and I did. And um, he was my angel. I had nobody else at that time who would even talk to me, and uh, I'd sit with him for an hour. I learned later, after he died, that he was a dedicated Hindu. That's where his spirit came from. Because I'm sure sitting with me for an hour was not a joy. But all I remember was he would say, don't drink and don't drug. It'll work out. You know what? It worked out way better than anybody could have imagined. I was there six, six months. And one day I was in the institution and a man stopped me. I had no intention of going to stupid AA. And um, he said, you want to come to a meeting? And without really thinking, I said, sure. And I went with him. Guess where we went? We went to a meeting of AA. And, you know, it caught me. It wasn't long. And I knew I was home. But I didn't know how to live. And um, my first sponsor got drunk. You see, this this is all very nice, this business of I get sober and, and uh, you know, I'm starting out sweeping a floor, all good. But I have no clue how to live, none. And so I got this sponsor and uh, she got drunk. And then I two men stepped forward. You know, when I think about how this all happens, I invite you to think about your life and how people have come into that life and brought gifts. These two men stepped forward and they said, you're too sick, Mildred, to stay here if you don't do the steps. I never want to forget that. I always tell that to new sponsees. You're too sick like I was to stay here if you don't do the steps. And I said... I don't know how, I can't read. And they said, we'll read to you. And they did. You know what? They held me accountable. Most of my life, nobody held me accountable. I did what I damn well pleased. What suited me, if I wanted it, I got it. And they held me accountable like this. You come to the meeting an hour and a half early, we'll be here. We'll read the book. We'll tell you what to do. And that's how I did the steps. You know what? They were right. The steps don't work. You know, in my opinion, the steps work by the grace of God. They don't work because I'm smart. They don't work because I know the meaning of everything. I'm not against that. But the simplicity of the steps, it was my heart that changed. And it would change because I did the actions they told me to take. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's 48 years ago, plus two months, and I got to stay. Has it always been an easy time? Not at all. Uh, my first, uh, I stayed on Skid Row for a year. And in that time, I should say, something powerful happened. I got a big sponsor. I say big because he was big in my heart and in my head. <clears throat> and he was strong. I can be very stubborn. He didn't care. He was stronger than I was. And he said, if you do what I asked you to do, everything will be fine. He said, you'll change and you'll find your own way in the program. And he was right. And uh, 
I obey. I, I'm going to say I, I did what he asked me to do because I trusted him. The secret of it was he knew how to live. <laughs> he knew how to what to do when he was angry. I used to see him because he had quite a temper, and I would see what how he handled himself when he was angry and what he did afterwards if he'd hurt somebody. I saw how he did business. I saw how he treated people in the program. I watched him, and he taught me. And one year went by, and I got off Skid Row. The voice said, look in the paper. See if you can get a decent job. And within two days, I had a teaching job. That's my profession. I'm an educator. And... uh I go into a college with 2,000 students and 200 adults, like teachers. <laughs> I don't know how to live with, with adults, with teachers. I can tell you, I could. That, that's a whole other story. It was painful beyond belief, but that's where that sponsor stepped up, and he taught me how to live. You know, in the 12 and 12 at the beginning, it says, we have here a set of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as the way of life, really change you and enable you to live peacefully whole. I always wanted that, didn't know how to do it. He taught me how to take these principles. You know, it's one thing to go to the meeting, isn't it? And we read the book. And then we discuss the, the steps. That's great. But how do you do it when you want to punch somebody in the face? How do you do it when you're depressed? How do you do it when a love affair goes bad? How do you do it when you want to buy something and you haven't got enough money? He taught me how and what to do. And I, I'm so grateful to, to him. When I was seven years sober, another God shot. Uh, Ken DeBaney from San Diego, he all, he taught me to call them God shots. The boys, a teacher came to me and said, you should buy a house. Because I'm still living really a poverty life. And um, how do you buy a house? I have no money saved. I had one of those sponsors who believed in paying off your debts. <laughs> you, you paid off your debts before you bought fancy cars and houses and God knows what. God has always provided for me what, everything that I've needed. It was the right time to start buying houses. And though I had not been able to save money, I bought my first house within 10 days, and I was to buy many houses, and I became very wealthy. And I say that not because, look at me, I say that because it's part of my growth, it's part of my learning experience. I knew how to live on Skid Row, I knew how to live in on the park bench. How do you live when you have money? I thought money and, you know, a fine car. And then, wonder of wonders, I built my own house. And I thought, this is all going to fix it. I'm going to be happy. You know what? I was more miserable than I had ever been. And one day, I sat on a curb, crying my eyes out, saying, what? And I was a good member of AA. You know, there are still people alive who were here when I when I was at this point in my life. They would tell you, I was a good member. I had a sponsor. I was sponsoring. I was going to meetings. I was doing service and on and on and on. You know what hadn't changed? The inside hadn't changed. It had changed enough that I could stay sober. But, oh, my goodness, those old beliefs were eating my lunch. That old stuff that said, you're not okay. I'd go to a meeting and people would say, oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm no longer alone. And I think, bully for you. Because I didn't feel that way. 
I did. I had no feelings. You know, when I was little, I shut out the world. And I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that that's what really goes on. In the first part of life, we learn how to maneuver, how to live in the third dimension. And then as we, if you're like me, you don't change on the inside enough. And those old beliefs have got to be taken care of. Why do I say that with such enthusiasm? Because Bill talked about it. This isn't, this isn't Mildred talking. If you look at page, at step eight in the 12 and 12, he talks about this. He says, we've got stuff buried. That's, he doesn't put it in this language. He says, buried below the level of consciousness. At the time stuff happened, it has given our emotions violent twists, which have since discolored our personalities. That was me. And I didn't know how to handle that. It's right in step eight. And, you know, if you read in, in, the, in the 12 and 12, because Bill was sober at this time, 14 years. <clears throat> and, you know, the article that he wrote on emotional sobriety, <clears throat> that's what he talks about, that stuff that's inside and he's trying to find his happiness. And, you know, I'm a great believer that there is a power. Not the power, I don't go to church. Haven't since I left the convent. Don't have anything against church. <clears throat> but Tom uh, Ibister is the one who took me aside and talked to me about the power of good. That's my God. The power of good that guides me, that makes sure I get what I want, I what I need. <clears throat> There, I needed some teachers. I needed somebody to teach me how to deal with that stuff that was inside. I don't know if you relate to this, but for me, it was a life changer. To no longer be dogged by those old beliefs, nobody loves me. See, <clears throat> the problem with that stuff is this. <clears throat> Hmm. I had that old belief, nobody likes me, nobody cares about me. You can't go through life like that and have any kind of happiness because what I was doing always, <clears throat> I wasn't real. I wasn't, I wasn't dealing with people. I was always manipulating. It, it looked like this. I need somebody to show me that I'm all right because I feel so not all right. So I, I was always trying to get somebody. I will do for you and then you will like me and then you'll treat me nice and then it'll all be sweetness and happiness. You know what happens in that? You sell your soul. And it does, life doesn't work like that. It's, we're meant, I think, to get right with God and get right with the world. And I wasn't doing that. And so God sent me the teachers and the, the, the member of AA who took me to step eight in the 12 and 12. And he said, read it. You're, you've got all this stuff churning inside. You know, sometimes I think about the park bench. I think about the park bench. And I think about the life of degradation that I lived. What was it about? It was all about this. I'll be nice to you. You want sex? I'll give you sex. I don't care if it's immoral or whatever the hell it is. And then you'll like me. And then if you like me, I'm okay. And that's the way I lived. You know, when I look back on it, I think, oh, my goodness. I, I learned. My teachers taught me. I was 21, 22 years sober, and my teachers taught me what to do with that, and I started to change. And when, see, this is, I understand this now. When I change inside, like there's all kinds of stuff has to be changed on the outside. I had done that, but I hadn't done the inside work. And life, if you don't change inside, you keep 
creating disaster on the outside. And my life started to change. Uh, and uh, I'm an absolute believer in that. Change on the inside. And uh, one day Father O'Brien called me and he asked, it was a new start in life. It was like a new start in life for me. Uh, walls came down. I didn't know I was behind walls. I mean, I didn't let people see who I really was. I didn't know how to do that. I had lived all my life with a big pretense. I'm so smart. I'm so this. I'm so that. I never let people see that I was dying inside. And as the walls came down, I became real. You know what I felt like? I felt like a chicken with no feathers. I didn't know how to be real, but I learned. And then when Father O'Brien invited me to start doing retreats, that was another big thing. But the, the last thing that I really, like, this has been the journey of my life. Getting sober, absolutely. But how do you then change so that that you, you begin to like life? That, for me, was the big story. About, I always had this in my head, and I didn't know it kind of an unhappiness with the way things are. And the unhappiness was, <clears throat> I'd be better off somewhere else. If I could just be in New York City, it would be all lights and goodness there. If I could be with different people, like, and that's not the way to live. You know, now Eckhart Tolle always talks about being in the present moment. Being present where you are. Um, you know, in Toronto, we read yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and it talks about, you know, forget about yesterday and leave tomorrow alone. All you've got is today. But even that isn't right. The only thing I've got is right now and what I'm doing right now. And if I'm here and I'm present and doing my best right now, then the next moment will be okay, too. That's how I've learned to live. Uh, in the process, one day I was with, <clears throat> I have, you know, I always think, what else do I have to learn? One day I was with some women and we were talking. Uh, I don't know what it was about. And two of them started to cry. I still remember this. You know, when you think back, you remember these times when, Something got you. And I, I said, why are you crying? And they said, because we feel sad. And, you know, I didn't feel sad. I thought sad, but I didn't feel sad. I didn't know what feelings were. I mean, it's stupid to say that. People think, am I making that up? No. No, I didn't know. I had shut myself down. To, to a way of life that just wasn't real. The point about that one is you can't grow in God consciousness when you do that. And God waits, I think, until, until you can do that. So um, this last 10 years, you know, somebody said to me, aren't you ashamed to say that, that it took you all this while? No, I'm not. It takes what it takes. You know, you can't. I couldn't talk like this. I didn't know this kind of stuff when I was 20 years sober. I know it now. I know what it's like to be alive and to be present in at this time and to know who I'm talking to and to know and to have some feelings about that and to have some good feelings about it. Those are the gifts of the program. It's not just... Well, you know, I haven't had a drink for 48 years. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. But what's really great is the change that takes place. And, and you know, the last 10 years have been, the, and I, as time goes on, I get more and more into the present moment. You know why that's so blessed? Because God's here. And when I'm in the present moment where God is, 
everything's okay. Somebody said to me, you know, how have you gotten through COVID? Piece of cake. For, and the other piece is, I've gotten through COVID because of Zoom and people like Jerry invited me to speak on Zoom because every time I get on Zoom, there are always people there who know me that I know, people I love. And even though we aren't physically together, I'm so blessed to be here with you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight. I hope may you all be safe and may you find what it is that you need to find peace and happiness. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.